Um, it is my great honor uh, as my, my first um, uh, task in this new position to welcome today's speaker for our lunchtime lecture, uh, Dr. Giuliano Morimoto, who is joining us um, virtually from the University of Aberdeen, where he is a uh, lecturer in um, the uh, Department of Zoology, I believe. <laughs> oh, yep. Sorry, the School of Biological Sciences. Um, so Giuliano uh, has um, really traversed the planet uh, in, <laughs> um, in his uh, work to date, starting off um, at the, during his bachelor's degree at the Federal University of Parana in Brazil, and then moving over to uh, this country to pursue his PhD at the University of Oxford. After that, he spent some years in Australia, um, both in um, first the University of Sydney and then at Macquarie University um, in postdoctoral positions before returning um, and starting a first fellowship at the University of Aberdeen where he is now um, a lecturer. And his research uh, is really focusing on um, nutrition and um, how animals interact with their food and the sort of different consequences of, of those interactions to individuals, groups, and different species. And what's really great about this talk today and what I'm really excited is that he's on a journey that I think many of us um, have done during our careers, which is starting from a you know an interest in biology and in organisms, but realizing that we need really a, a fundamental basis in mathematics to to answer the kinds of questions that we are interested in um, with a with the level of rigor that we want to answer those questions in. And so his talk today, I think, will be extremely interesting and also extremely useful, um, and hopefully will help others encourage themselves along this journey, which we, which we all have to take in many ways, usually if we are biologists in these fields. So with that, I would like to introduce Juliana to take us on through his clumsy journey as a biologist in the world of mathematics. Thank you very much, Angelique, and thank you for the society for actually hosting me in, in this talk. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be here, especially because it is almost exactly four years that I was elected a fellow at the Linnean Society. Uh, and I never thought I would be giving a talk to, to, to the society as a whole. So thank you very much for, for the invite. Um, so let's start. Um, I know all biologists panic when they see this, right? I panic myself uh, when I used to, to see mathematical formulas such as this. I can assure you that the talk today is not meant to scare you in any ways. Uh, it's really meant to encourage and, and really to, to show you how myself, a biologist, uh, could uh, gain some insights using, using mathematics. And to do that, I would like to start with a story, actually. So this is, I would like to, you to meet Rafael, or Rafa, as we used to call him, and he is my was my high school teacher, my math, 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 math high school teacher. And in Brazil, I, I don't know if you have this in the UK, but in Brazil, you ha we have a, a national maths competition, which we call the Olympics for maths. And every year, uh, uh, maths teachers, they have to select few students to, to sit this exam. And Rafa had this inglorious task of selecting uh, amongst us. And he came to me one day and he was talking to me that I should sit this exam. And then, you know, I was, I was never very good in maths, just for full disclosure. And, and I, I was talking to him and said, look, Rafa, I'm not very comfortable, especially because, you know, I'm not very good in geometry. And then he was like, well, it's not that you're, very, you're bad in geometry, it's just that you're absolutely hopeless. So that <laughs> was my first trauma. Uh, into the field of mathematics. And that really got into me uh, uh, years later. So then I decided to do biology as, uh, as many biologists do to avoid maths. Uh, um, and also because I love biology, but also because I thought it, it, uh, it was going to avoid maths. Then fast forward in 2015, I was at Oxford doing my PhD and I needed one more chapter to actually finish, finish my, my, my thesis. And I was discussing with my supervisors uh, at the time, and uh, we ended up settling for a, a chapter on, on investigating on the effects of nutrition on, on reproduction. And to do that, I came across a paper by Steve Simpson and David Halbenheimer called The Multilevel Analysis of Feeding Behavior, The Geometry of Nutrition. And when I read the title, all my fears uh, you know, emerged, came back, my childhood trauma, 
and I thought I was going to have a panic attack, thought of dropping out. <laughs> but in reality, it's not that difficult. And if I got it, and I'm hopeless, uh, I'm pretty sure you, you're going to uh, get it also with, with no effort whatsoever. So I'm just going to briefly explain to you what is this geometry of nutrition, because that is a fundamental part of, of, of the talks and the results that I'm going to show you today. So imagine that you have an X and Y axis, right? The X and Y axis. But instead of, of being numbers, what you, the axis represent the intake of nutrients, okay? Uh, in this case, for the sake of the example, let's say that we're looking and investigating at the effects of protein and carbohydrate intake, okay? So they form your axis. Um, and then what you do is you divide this space, which we call nutritional space, uh, formed by these two variables, into rails. You know, you split this, this nutritional space. And these rails represent diets that have the fixed ratio of nutrients, of the nutrients that you're looking for, right? Or that you're trying to study. Once you have these rails, what you do is you select what we call anchor points, which are the diets that you're actually going to go to the lab and cook those diets. And they're the diets that you're going to have, you know, if you're working with animals, you're going to feed animals onto those diets. Now we call, you know, animals, as you can see, they can move up and down. So they can eat more or less of the food in each of these anchor points, but they cannot move across nutritional rails. Okay. And that enables us to map a fitness trait into the next dimension. Okay. So imagine that you have a third dimension now coming towards you, coming away from the screen. Uh, where you map any fitness trait that you want. What you end up with, it's something like this, right? It's a pretty colorful and a nice, pretty picture. Uh, in this case, is the effect of carbohydrate and protein on the lifespan of fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster, right? This is just a landmark paper, and it's just this kind of result that you get from applying the, the geometry of nutrition uh, to, to your data set. Now, the geometry of nutrition is actually powerful because it enables us to do very complex uh, analysis that were not possible before, right? And this, I'm gonna give you just a brief history of, of the analysis of nutrition. And of, for the purpose of the talk, this is a simplistic view and, it do, and it's not necessarily reflecting the, the chronology of how these frameworks uh, uh, were proposed, but I just simplify and put them in order of complexity. So in the past, well, we still have it, but in the past, the original models for uh, uh, understanding nutrient interactions was, for instance, the optimal foraging theory, where we had a simplistic model where we're trying to find the best strategies that optimize a, a currency. In this case, usually you have to collapse what animals were trying to maximize as a function of energy. So in that sense, we didn't have a nutrient explicit model. What we had is a model that took into account energy as the currency that was being optimized. Then we moved to, from optimal foraging theory to nutrient stoichiometry, which was a, a more complex model and was developed in, in, in the context of plant and soil sciences uh, to look at the balance of particular chemicals in, in, as, as nutrients, right? And in this case, uh, you have a complex model which enables this multidimensional comparisons because you can compare as many uh, chemical compounds as you, as you want, essentially. Uh, but it's not, again, nutrient explicit. You don't know where these chemicals come from, if it's a specific nutrient or is a combination of nutrients, uh, um, even though you can tell which exactly chemical you're talking about. And that's where nutritional geometry or the geometry of nutrition comes handy because it is a complex model. So you can study any number of nutrients uh, but it is also nutrient explicit model. So each axis, as we showed before, is, is a nutrient intake. Uh, and more importantly, as in optimal foraging theory, you can also disentangle the effect of energy, right? As you know, as, as I talked to you before, animals can eat more or less of a diet. And this enables us to quantify not only the effects of nutrients, but the effects of the amount of nutrients on a particular trait. And because of this, uh, uh, you know, complexity, but also uh, power uh, of the geometry, nutritional geometry, the, the framework has been used and is progressively used uh, more and more in, in the fields of ecology, biology, medicine, 
as a whole. And here's just a few examples of, of, of applications of, of the geometry of nutrition in, in, in this case, it, to, to model the nutritional niche of a copy pod. Um, Samantha Solombiet uh, more recently used this geometry, the nutritional geometry uh, to, to study the effects of nutrients on obesity and cardiovascular disease using a, a mice model. And, and really because of its power, because you can use any number of nutrients, the geometry of nutrition may hold the key for us to advance the field of personalized nutrition for livestock and humans, because in this case, we can actually fine tune uh, what is the best diet, looking at every component of the diet uh, in particular. And that's where the, the interest and the focus on, on the geometry of nutrition uh, came from. Now, as I said, during my PhD, uh, I, I wasn't very much interested in the model itself. I was interested in applying the model. And I was interested in applying the model uh, to study the effects of nutrition on, on, on sexual selection, right? And if, if you're not familiar with, with the the sexual selection uh, a field is just a brief uh, recap. So you have a sexual selection, but sexual selection is divided into two episodes. You have a, a, a competition for, for mates, which what we call pre-copulatory sexual selection. And you have a competition for the fertilization of mates, is, in this case, let's say a, a male competing to fertilize females' eggs, which we call a post-copulatory sexual selection. And these two episodes, uh, require different adaptations and different traits if, if, if individuals are to, to succeed. So what we were interested in, it was to really look at the effects of, of diet on these two episodes of, of selection. Uh, just a brief side note here, if you are interested in, in the field of sexual selection, definitely recommend reading the uh, Team Brickhead uh, paper in the Journal of Zoology with the, perhaps the best title I've ever seen in a paper. Uh, and the read itself is, is really good. So if you're interested, definitely recommend the read. So the broad, questions, broad, broad question that we're interested in is, is there a diet that maximizes both pre and post copulatory traits in male fruit flies? So we were using fruit flies uh, as a model organism in this case. And the way that we do this, the way we do this in flies is, is as following. So we have this experimental design this is standard in the field where basically what I did is I depleted male ejaculate reserves by mating with, with females that were not part of the experiment. Uh, once I deplete those males, I allocate males to diets, right? And allow them to feed for four days. And then I ran what we call a P1 and P2 experiment. And a P1 and P2 experiments, the details, you don't need to know what P1 and P2 stands for is position one and position two. So if essentially what we do is we mate our focal male, the male that we treated with the diets as a position one with a female, a naive female, and that female would then mate with a competitor male. That's a P1 experiment. And a P2 experiment is when a, the naive female mates with a competitor male, and then remates with the focal male that were exposed to the diets. And this experimental design seems complex and convoluted, but it's just because it allows us to assess how diet influenced the ability of males to attract uh, uh, mates in terms of naive mates, but also mates that had mated with other competitors, but also the ability of males to fertilize the females' eggs. So I use the Geometry of nutrition again. So you expect to see those beautiful, uh, bright landscapes. But in this particular case, I was looking at the effects of protein and carbohydrate. Uh, I use 15 diets, and the fitness trace that we are interested in is a male attractiveness, which is a measure of, of pre copulatory sexual selection uh, and, and total uh, male offspring production or total pair, mating pair offspring production. Uh, as a proxy of, of pose mating or pose copulatory sexual selection. Uh, and this is what we found. So essentially male attractiveness is maximized in a diet that is very balanced, right? So a protein to carbohydrate ratio of one to one. And you can see that the black lines are the ratio of one to one just to aid uh, interpretation. But when we look at post copulatory sexual selection, 
uh, uh, these ratios was much lower. So you, you needed a lot more, males needed a lot more carbohydrate to actually maximize the number of offspring they were producing. So that to us suggested that there was no single diet that males could eat that would maximize their ability to, to win in both pre and post copulatory uh, sexual selection. So in a sense, what we were showing is that there is a nutritional trade-off that males have to balance. They either have to maximize one, the other trait, or neither uh, in terms of, of diet. Right. But if you look at this, and I, I show you that the black line was a, 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 a way of, you, of to aid interpretation. But in reality, that's how analysis of nutritional geometry actually went. It was mostly visual. Okay, so we would look at these landscapes, we would find more or less where their peak region is or the, the rails that cross still speaks, and then we would start making inferences in terms of, of trade-offs, right? But this is not really a, a, a solid way of actually analyzing the data, right? Um, and that limited the application of the, the, the method of the geometry of nutrition, because even though we had this very powerful method that could analyze nutrition in N dimensions, uh, we, we were limited in the analytical frameworks that we could implement to analyze those data. And that meant that we couldn't actually do comparative studies so that we would gain a broader understanding of how animals uh, respond to nutrition overall. The analogy that I make is that you, we had a, a Formula One Ferrari card, but we had to push it. So we couldn't, in other words, we couldn't extract the full power of the framework because we were limited in the, in the analytical methods that we, we used to, to find those nutritional trade-offs. And that's when I progressively became more and more aware and, and make use of, of mathematical concepts. And for now, I'm gonna give you a brief and it's very brief because the field has, you know, it's evolving as we speak um, of the past and the present uh, analytical developments to analyze these nutritional geometry landscapes. And that's where the maths start to, to come up. And the first, uh, first framework, analytical framework designed uh, specifically to analyze nutritional trade-offs is what I call the vector of sloped approach by James Rapkin and, and John Hunt in 2008, and, and the vector slopes approach goes as following, right? So you, you have those landscapes, so you have the metrics, how much individuals eat of a particular nutrient, and the response of, in the terms of the fitness trait of, of, for, the, for what you're looking for, right? So what you do is essentially you, if you fit a regression model, of a nutrient intake. So in this case, red is, is for protein and, and blue is for carbohydrate intake uh, onto the fitness trait. And you get those slopes and those slopes of those regressions become components of a vector, okay? Don't worry if you don't know what vector it is. Um, what you do need to know is that once you have those two components, you can, you can draw, let's say, an arrow in, in, in your in a X and Y axis, let's say, uh, which is the vector pointing in the direction that the, the vector and the, the slopes are, are determined, determined, right? So this is just an example, right? So you have this for trait one, which is this green vector, you, you find the slopes and the slopes give you this, this arrow. And then you do the same for, you know, however many traits you have, and you calculate the angle, what we call angle theta, between those two or three or four vectors. And this angle theta, in theory, represents the strength of the nutritional trade-off that animals experience. So if you have a small theta, means that the slopes, that the, the fitness traits respond very similar to the nutrients, and therefore, uh, the assumption is that individuals could maximize both traits. So you have a weak nutritional trade-off. Uh, when the th theta is very large, the, the assumption is that males or individuals 
could not maximize both both traits traits at the same time they would have to compromise right now quick question to you actually i, I mean you don't need to answer uh if you, you can leave it on the chat can you pick up what is not very good about this model i will give you a few seconds just to look at it and to think what is not very good about it I cannot see the chat, but I think uh, Padma can, can keep track of it. Right, so I will assume that um, I'll give you a few more seconds. Can you think about anything that is wrong that is not very good on this model? Right, so I'm going to reveal the answer. Um, if you think about this, slopes can be positive, negative, or zero, right? This means that if you draw a vector with the coordinates of the slopes, the components there are slopes, essentially your vector can point in any direction, right? So the two slopes can be positive, uh, the two slopes can be negative, or they can alternate. However, the traditional trade-offs can only exist in the plus-plus region, right? So animals either eat, they don't eat, or they eat a positive amount of food, right? So in a sense, nutritional trade-offs only exist in this, uh, this green box that we're talking about. But the vector slopes approach would suggest that this can happen across the whole, the whole domain, basically. And that, ladies and gentlemen, took me about four weeks to figure it out because my default mode was to doubt myself, right? And I literally, and that, I mean literally, printed the landscapes because I was doing the calculations and it, it was just not working out the way it was supposed to work out. I literally printed the landscapes and I was measuring the angles by hand. That's how much I doubted myself. And I guess it goes back to my childhood trauma since I'm hopeless. Um, but I was right, in a sense, right? It, it, it cannot, it, that doesn't happen. And the consequences of that is that vector of slopes approach could overestimate the strength of nutritional trade-offs in these nutritional geometry studies. With that, after four weeks of solid measuring by hand, I partnered with uh, Matthew Leoho at the University of Toulouse, and we developed a new analytical framework that not only addresses this problem, but also enables us to do comparative nutrition. Remember that comparative nutrition is a limitation currently, was a limitation in this framework. And we call this uh, new methodology vector of positions instead of vector slopes. And the reason is as following. Remember that vector slopes, you had to do a linear regression, right? In our model, in our framework, we, instead of doing regressions, we look at the landscape itself and we find the region that is corresponds to the peak region of this landscape. Once we have the coordinates for those peaks, those coordinates become the component of the vector. And then we do this exactly the same thing as the vector of slope. So we, we plot those vectors and we calculate the angle between them. And just like the vector slopes approach, uh, uh, you know, smaller angles means that a weaker trade-off and larger angles means a strong nutritional trade-off because the assumption is that the peaks, if it is a weak nutritional trade-off, the peaks are very closely aligned and therefore the angle between the vectors would be, be small. The problem is that, I don't know if you tried, but computers are not very smart unless you tell them to do it. And it's really hard for a computer to actually find the region the peak region in this multidimensional landscape. So what we, we did actually to mitigate this, to solve this problem is to develop, to, to apply a machine learning model, which is called a support vector machine to actually find this peak region, which would give us the components of the vector that we could calculate theta. So just here, just to exemplify the application of, of the vector positions approach, Basically what we have, we have, let's say two landscapes. Um, we find the peak region. So we use the machine learning model to find the peak region. 
once we have the peak region, we represent them as vectors and we compare the angle theta between the vectors. Now, when we compare the vector slopes and the vector positions approach to each other and their performance, we see that you know when the, the angles, so when the vectors are more or less aligned, so that when nutritional trade-offs are weak, uh, um, both, both approaches kind of provide similar results, right? But when, as the angles diverge, the vector slopes progressively became overestimated the angle and, this, and therefore the strength of this nutritional trade-off. So in this case, for instance, uh, the green is the, the vector of slopes, the red is the vector of, of positions. And you can see that the vector of slopes in this case overestimated the, the angle by 2.4 times. And for the other trade-off, it actually overestimated by four times the, the angle of, of of the nutrition of, of the vectors. And this goes back to the idea that you know the, the in the vector of slopes, you could draw the vectors across the entire domain, both positive and, and negative values. And what was good of our approach is that when we test it in, in simulated higher dimensional data, it seems to be doing a very good job as well. So the, in the sense that enables us, and in mathematical terms, in theory, you can apply this, this approach to any dimensions. And therefore we solve the problem and the limitation of, of not having analytical frameworks to analyze the geometry of nutrition. And then we celebrate it, right? But as always, we celebrate it a little bit too soon. Because yes, it's true, the vector oppositions approach allows for accurate estimates of multidimensional trade-offs, but it also has limitations, right? One of the limitations is that this vector of, of positions, so the machine learning model involved in recognizing uh, the, the peak in the, in the landscape is very expensive computationally. Um, and not only that, the model still requires the user to input a, a, a threshold value uh, to, to find the correct global maximum in those landscapes. And that means that we're it, it's not very good because then it becomes subjective, right? So you might use the model with a different threshold value than myself, and then the, it affects reproduci reproducibility of, of the result. So I wasn't very happy with that. And more importantly, because it was so slow and computationally expensive to run, it was virtually impossible to actually do comparative studies of the statistical models that could be used to search and find the peak regions in the landscape. So in a sense, yes, vector oppositions approach allows us to advance in, in, on the limitations that we had, but it had limitations on its own. And that's why it came where we are today, which is the model that I've developed uh, this year called Nutrigonometry. And I'm very happy with this with title. And you understand why the, the title is like that. Um, and, and the trigonometry model, it's it's really is really something else. So remember that we were talking about the multidimensional landscape and you you kind of split right into rails. But if you split into rails, that actually creates a right angle triangle as we show here, as I show here in the figure, right? And with that right angle triangle, we can use the Pythagoras formula to actually estimate the angle of this nutritional rail. And if we have two traits, we can use Pythagoras to estimate angles of those two traits and calculate the difference between the angles of these triangles, which is exactly the angle theta that we were measuring before, but it's just a different way of actually finding it. Right, and, and, and it is a simpler way, but it allows us to not only calculate a lot faster, but also to estimate nutritional trade-offs, not only in terms of the ratio of nutrients that, that animals eat and their consequences to fitness, but also in terms of quantity. Because if you remember from high school maths, the Pythagoras theorem, theorem of, of the side square equals the hypotenuse square, the sum of the side squares equals the side of hypotenuse squares, then you can also measure not only the angle in terms of sines and cosines, but also the hypotenuse. So it gives us more power in terms of, of finding nutritional trade-offs. 
And that's why it's called new trigonometry. So in the end, we all have to thank Pythagoras for coming up with the Pythagor uh, Pythagoras theorem. And it's fantastic because new trigonometry is so much faster. It's so, com it's so much more computation. It's so, how do you say that? Computationally cheaper uh, relative to the other models. And that enables us to test the, how other statistical models are actually doing when we, are, when we ask them to find the peak regions in those landscapes. So this is what I did. So I did this comparative approach of statistical models and I compared the Bayesian linear regression, the standard linear regression, generalized additive models, uh, K nearest neighbors, gradient boosting, random forest and the support vector machine that I use in the vectors of position approach. But this time I didn't use the input threshold because I wanted to know uh, the performance if let's say someone that doesn't actually, uh, uh, you know, does meta development, meta development for, for living, how would they fare using the support vector machine? And I don't expect you to, you know, you don't need to actually see and read everything. What I want to show here with this image is just the perform overall performance. So on, on the bigger panel, you have, you know, landscapes of two traits, lifespan and reproductive rate. And the smaller panels, you have the, the regions that each of those models uh, found using the new trigonometry approach. Then you can see that some of them do better than others, right? They find more compact, more homogeneous reason, uh, regions. And I'm gonna zoom in uh, in one of those just so you can see more clearly. So you can see that for instance, let's say the support vector machine without the threshold input finds very disconnected regions on those landscapes. And that's something that we don't want because that can bias our estimates on nutritional trade-offs. What was not, not surprising, but what was interesting is that what nutrigonometry actually revealed is that simple linear regression or Bayesian linear regression models outperformed complex models such as the, all the machine learning models in finding this global peak uh, in the geometry, in the, the nutritional geometry landscape. So you can see the base and, and the first two uh, uh, panels, the base and LM are the Bayesian linear regression linear, and normal linear regression. Uh, and they are doing quite well. They find very compact regions that overlap with the expected peak region, right? And they in fact do find uh, the nutritional trade-off that we now know exists on this, this data set uh, uh, in, estimate the, this trade-off accurately in, in as a function of that angle that we were talking about. But then you can you can come to me and say like, okay, yeah, but that, those are not the only models, right? So for instance, you have that gum tensor that does a fair, fair, a fair job actually in finding this nutrient uh, scape. And that's true. So we have other models that actually found this, nu this nutri nutritional trade-off uh, between these traits, but either these models did not find a homogeneous region, such as for instance, the KNN, if you look at the middle panel in the second uh, row, there is not a homogeneous region that the model found, or in the case of a gum tensor, a generalized additive model with tensor product, it found a very good region, but the output of a, a generalized additive model is not something that you want. And I won't have time to talk to you about this today, but what I can say is that the Bayesian or the general linear model output is a polynomial that you can further uh, um, um, manipulate and use to calculate other things that we are doing with the trigonometry model. So in a sense, generalized linear model is simple, simple and, and does a good job and gives you the output that you can even analyze uh, further uh, uh, um, in your field. So essentially that was what the past and present and in a sense, my contributions to the field, to the development of, of these analytical frameworks to analyze nutritional geometry. And to that, I actually had to learn quite a bit, a lot of, of mathematics uh, um, to go around. So this is just a summary. So we start with the vector slopes in 2018, and then we propose the vector positions in 2018. And now we have nutrigonometry that is currently under review. It's also in a preprint form. So if you want to, to have a look, uh, feel free to do so. Now, just to make justice to everyone uh, working in the field, uh, these are not necessarily the only 
analysis that we're interested in when we do these nutritional landscapes. And other theoretical models have been developed to, to analyze other aspects of animal nutrition. Let's say what we call rules of compromise. And if you are interested in those, uh, please see the body of work by Steve Simpson and David Halbeheimer and, and they, as they are developing uh, other analytical frameworks for other areas in this geometry of nutrition. Right. But that, so to, uh, to get to that point, I had to, as I said, four weeks measuring things by hand, I had to actually face and overcome some of the childhood trauma that I had. And it was quite enjoyable in a sense, right? Because I got to interact with very nice people, very friendly people and mathematicians and, and statisticians that were very, very uh, welcoming of, uh, you know, lost biologists uh, trying to find their way through some of their numbers and formulas that they have on a daily basis. And once I've got the hang of it, I learned a little bit, then I decided, I, I, you know, I, I really enjoyed it and I want to apply more and more concepts of, of, of from mathematics into the field of biology or ecology more, more generally. And with that, I want to introduce you to a concept called the niche hypervolume because it is similar to the concept that we were talking before in terms of nutritional geometry, right? Because remember nutritional geometry can represent any dimensions and niche hypervolumes as well. You can represent a species in any dimensions any number of dimensions. Uh, but instead of nutrients now, we're talking about ecological variables. So your X and Y axis are no longer intake of a particular nutrient, but they are, for instance, temperature and humidity. And, and, and the points that you plot are the points in which you observe the species that, that you're interested in, right? And that's what we call, this is a concept of, of a niche hypervolume, which was proposed first by, by Hutchinson in 1957. Right. More formally, we can define these niche hypervolumes uh, as um, multidimensional point clouds uh, that set that, that represent a set of, of environmental uh, variables that your species can exist and does occupy. And, and here I just have a graph of a representation of what a niche hypervolume will look like in, in three dimensions. And niche hypervolumes have been important because uh, they have been used to, to study a whole range of, of ecological phenomena, such as, for instance, range shifts of, of invasive species, uh, but also to predict responses to, to, to climate change. Here on the panel, I'm just showing a, a recent study by Tingley and collaborators where they were analyzing the range expansion of, of the cane toad in Australia. Cane toads is a major invasive species uh, uh, in, in Australia. Right, so niche hypervolumes are, are quite important in a sense of, of enabling us to understand ecology. What is interesting from our perspective is that niche hypervolumes, those point clouds, they can actually have holes in it, right? Uh, uh, and these holes, we hypothesize, uh, are holes that permit the invasion by other species with the appropriate uh, ecological strategy. And this is really clearly defined by Benjamin Blonder in 2016, uh, right? So you have this niche hypervolume and you have a hole in the middle and an invader can, can you know, uh, invade this particular uh, hypervolume, right? The problem is that it's really difficult to find those holes, right? In these niche hypervolumes, particularly if you're talking about high dimensional data, so data that we cannot actually represent graphically. Benjamin Blunder actually proposed a method that we could use to, to find those holes, but those methods, they, they rely on volume, on the volume of these hypervolumes that you draw. Surprise, surprise though, maths uh, play a trick on us. And as the as your number of dimensions increase of any hypervolume or any object, the volume of this hypervolume tends to zero. And this is the only formula that will actually show you in this, uh, in this uh, presentation. And this is the volume of a sphere as the, as the number of dimensions increase. And you can see that it tends to zero. So then we have a conundrum. So how can we find the holes in these niche hypervolumes uh, that are of high dimension? 
So that's how I, I came and partnered with uh, Pedro. So Pedro is a, is a P, it's last year PhD candidate in, in, in mathematics. And, and Pedro and I, so he's a topologist, it's a field of mathematics. Uh, and, and he works, uh, there is a concept in topology called uh, homology. And persistence homology is a, a concept that we use to analyze the shape of the data. So your data, when you plot it, you don't only re do regressions that us biologists do all the time, but the shape, the overall shape of the data has information. And persistence homology is a way that we can extract information from the shape of the data. And I'm just gonna briefly introduce what persistence homology is and how we calculate it. So imagine that you have a point cloud, you know, as we saw for the new hypervolume. At each of those points, let's say that you start growing a ball of radius R, okay? For each in this, in each of these points, and this is the purple region around each dot that you're seeing there. And then you increase, you start to increase, increase the radius of this ball. When two balls touch each other, then you connect the two data points, okay? And then you do this, you continue to increase and continue to connect the points until all the points are connected. And this is what is shown here in this figure, right? So you increase the radius, so the, the purple region. As the points touch, the balls touch, you connect the components and the data points in those balls until all the components are connected, right? And this gives you what we call a persistence diagram, which is a way to analyze this persistence homology data, which basically says that, so if you have a data point and you started with a radius R, that data point was born, as we say it. And the data point is born and lives until it's connected to something else, okay? And at the point that this connected to something else, we say that this point died. So what you get is a persistence diagram that you have the radius of these tiny balls in which the point was born and the radius that this point died. Okay, so in the diagonal you have, you know, the same time that the point is born, it dies essentially. So they are so close to each other that any ball of any radius makes them connected and so on and so forth. So we use this persistence diagram. Uh, the useful part of this persistence diagram is that it allows us to find holes in the data set. And that's what we actually did. So we proposed the use of the persistence homology approach or concept to analyze holes in potentially biological data. And the way we did that, it was by first showing that you can find holes and you can differentiate between a sphere, a hollow sphere, and a hollow torus uh, using persistence homology. Here's just, you know, the arrows just pointing to the different uh, uh, pattern that you can use to differentiate it to shapes. And if we can do that with the simple forms, we hypothesize that we could do that with more complex forms, such as the niche hypervolumes. And that's what we, we, we did. So we, we thought of applying this persistent homology to find holes in the data set. And, and we did, so we downloaded a whole bunch of, of ecological data set, a uh, 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 presence ecological data set for, for a species. And we ran the persistence homology to find the holes in this, in this data set. So these are just a snapshot of, of some species that may or may not have holes. Some of them don't have holes. And, and the question now, and now that we have this framework, the question is now that we are addressing is, okay, how does these holes evolve? Why do they evolve? And what is the ecological significance of, of these holes, right? So the methodology that we use to the, to the, the paper that we use to conceptualize the application of persistent homology to ecology has been accepted actually two days ago. Uh, and now we are on the ongoing work is to do this ecological significance and comparative analysis of, of, of holes. That enabled me to think in a bigger picture, right? So now remember that we were talking about nutrition is a very specific topic. Then we move to ecological variables and now uh, uh, we can move to bigger and bigger problems. One of these bigger problems is actually a mathematical problem, is to actually solve the inverse problem. Is actually, instead of going from the point cloud to this persistence diagram, what we want oops, is to 
go from the persistence di diagram to reconstruct the point cloud. And it sounds simple, but apparently mathematicians keep telling me that is virtually impossible. But Pedro and I, we are, we are, uh, we are trying to, to actually prove uh, that, that it is possible to, to go the other direction as well. Rather than that, and that's actually was the reason why I was invited for the talk, and we are almost done, I promise, um, is that once we were talking about, okay, distributions of species, how species respond to climate change using these hypervolumes, uh, Nat, which was my honor student, she did her honors with me, and now she's at, with Owen Lewis in Oxford doing her PhD. Nat is outstanding. She's absolutely a rocket. Uh, and she came to the lab to asking the questions, okay, you know, we can do all this modeling. We can understand the biology and the ecology of the species. But if we're talking about uh, conservation, we not only need to understand the conservation and the biology of the species, but we also need to understand the conservation policies that enable us to enforce uh, the conservation acts that we have in place. So her question was to ask, okay, are UK conservation policies fit for purpose for the protect insect biodiversity specifically? So what Nat uh, uh, did is she surveyed uh, a whole bunch of policies in the UK, both at the UK level, but also in devolved countries. Uh, and she also surveyed uh, policies in, in Ireland for proximity to understand whether these policies were fit for purpose. And what I'm gonna show you is, is the plot that looks something like this, right? So we have the number of species that are protected by the policies in the y-axis, and we have the number of species at risk of extinction by the IUCN red list in the x-axis. And in the diagonal, essentially, is the line that everything that is at risk is protected. Then we have the situation where we protect more than, than there are species at risk, but the worst situation that uh, species that are at risk that are not protected. And what Nat did is she did a comparison between what these conservation policies were doing, both for insects, but also for mammals, just to have a, a landmark to, for, for comparison. And here, don't, don't need to read it all. What we show is you can clearly see that for insects, which are the green dots, uh, virtually all of them lie below the, the, the line of 100% protection, whereas all the mammals lie almost on the line or as close to the line as possible. And I'll just show you, if we break down by orders, you can see more clearly that virtually all mammals that are at risk of extinction are protected, uh, uh, whereas almost all insects that are at risk of extinction are not. The exception is uh, Lepidoptera, okay? So what we took for that is that UK and Irish conservation policies fail to protect insect biodiversity. And for those insects that they are protected, there is a bias towards butterflies and moths. So butterflies and moths are, are the primarily, the, the insects that are primarily protected by this, uh, this conservation policies today. And I was talking to Padma just before, uh, oh, the paper was published in, uh, earlier this year in biological conservation. And what I was talking to, to Padma earlier, it was that the ongoing plans now is for us to host a workshop to create a policy recommendation for the UK and, and Irish government. And for that, I mean, I think this is a perfect platform uh, to interact and to get buy-in from experts uh, and for anyone that is interested in fellows of, of, of learning societies, such as the Linnean Society, but also the Royal Entomological Society and so on and so forth. So this is, could, could be a, a way forward uh, for the society as a whole to, to interact more, more in, in terms of a policy. So briefly, some, some broad lessons that I learned now, just to wrap up. Uh, in a sense, brought the lessons that I learned in this journey coming from trauma to, to what I am now, actually based in the Institute of Mathematics, um, is this, if you are interested in, in this path, is that biology can benefit a lot from concepts and frameworks and just a way of thinking using mathematics. Not all mathematicians care about no mathematical subjects, just be aware of that. And it's not personal, usually, um, but, you know, they, they might not be interested in, in, in engaging with you, and that's okay. Uh, the thinking involving in statistics is not the same involving maths. Just be aware of that. So maths and stats think very differently. 
even though for us biologists, they look like two very similar subjects. Uh, so don't think that just because uh, you're, for instance, an ecologist that has a lot of, of statistical background that you can just break through and it will be easier for you in maths. Uh, and it is okay to feel stupid. I feel stupid all every day, basically. Uh, but embrace the experience. Take your time to learn at your own pace, and ask for help and guidance because they are, they're, you know, as I said, they're very nice and they're usually willing to, to help. And one thing that I learned is don't be offended. They don't mean it. Sometimes what is simpler, what is simple for them, it might not be simpler, simple to us. And, and I've had a lot of comments such as, for instance, oh, this is obvious, isn't it? Like, why are you doing this? That can be uh, uh, offensive, but it's really just that they think differently and they have different uh, way of approaching problems. So don't be offended, but instead try to engage and interact with them. Now, just to finalize, I'm running out of time. So uh, remember I talked about Rafa, my high school teacher, and I think I let, uh, I, I didn't make him justice. So Rafa was my first mentor, actually, even though he caused me trauma, um, he was my first mentor. And together we wrote a book to help at risk high school kids to learn concepts of geometry, because in Brazil, this is particularly, uh, it's a subject that is particularly troubling for, for students. So the book is called Poetic Geometry. Uh, uh, the book is only in Portuguese, unfortunately, because it was designed for, for Brazilian students, but it's freely available online. And the web page is, is down below if you are interested. Uh, we could potentially do a, a English version of it. Um, but what was surprising is that uh, we had a lot of, of positive engagement with students uh, in, in high schools, and they were very interested, not only on the mathematical part, but also engaging with the scientists in the STEM subject. And we had so many positive feedbacks of, for instance, students that were not thinking of applying for university that a, they are now uh, doing, doing a degree in STEM. And that's really, really rewarding for all of us. And I really have uh, Rafa to, to thank for, for the career in a sense, right? The mentorship. And with that, I would like to thank you and the society and all the funders uh, uh, for, for listening to me and for supporting the research that, that I do. And I'll take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Juliano. That was an absolutely fantastic lecture. Um, I have some questions, but before I launch in, I always have lots of questions. Um, <laughs> can I open it up to anybody from the audience who has any questions? Or I can start it going, you guys can jump in. Um, look at me waiting just yet, so we're probably typing them out. So I will launch in. First of all, um, that was really fantastic. I really enjoyed seeing how you kind of progressed from you know, fairly straightforward regressions into far more complicated things. And it's certainly you know, something that we struggle with in my own group and in our own field. Um, a lot is when you have such a capacity to gather data um, that is multidimensional, incredibly information rich, but actually the capacity to analyze those data in meaningful ways is actually really limiting um, and really limited because the, the methods just aren't available now. And that means we spend a lot of time trying to modify methods that aren't necessarily fit for purpose. And so thinking about where they fall, sure, I really like your example of you know, the problem with those vectors, actually, because it's definitely the sort of thing I can very much see myself doing where you realize, you know, you just don't trust the results because of this kind of basic uncomfortableness with math, but knowing that we have to constantly use it. Yeah. Your persistent homology aspect, I thought was incredibly interesting. Um, because it's really similar. So I love that um, that ecological hyperspace. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea, I definitely want to see this paper when it comes out, or you can send me an early draft, of not yeah. just looking at the amount, but actually the shape of that empty space is really fascinating to me. One thing that we do a lot in my group is we look at um, skull shape. So we gather geometric morphometric data. We look at morphospaces. I can have a morphospace in my necklace right here. Um, oh, there you Okay. <laughs> Um, and um, and uh, and we try to look at you know how much of the shape is uh, how much of morphospace space is empty or full or what, where it's distributed. But actually, I don't think I've seen this specific concept of the shape of empty morphospaces spaces applied to shape space. Do you know of anything along those lines? I do. I, we are, I, I'm glad you said that because this niche hypervolume can be used as a morphometric hyperspace or hypervolume, right? And we actually are running as we speak. I am running on, on the background. 
generating these hypervolumes on these morphometric spaces and applying persistence homology to those hyperspaces with a data set from a published paper, I think it was 2019. Um, the only thing that, so I don't know if your case is similar. One thing that usually people do when you have such a high dimension is you do a PCA, let's say, yeah. right? So you do a, a dimensionality reduction. Yeah. And now we, what we are trying to do is here in my blackboard is we're trying to see what is the effect of this dimensionality reduction to the properties of the empty space. Because it might be essentially what you're doing is you're projecting, right? Into high space, into lower space. But that can create you know, it can uh, change the topology. And then if you apply persistence homology, you might have actually not actually capture everything that is there, but it's definitely possible to apply. And that's the perfect example of how yeah. we could implement persistence homology to, to morphometrics. I guess also that um, along those lines, I suppose, what do you do about, I think with the ecological spaces that you were showing, um, if it, it looked like it was more, you know, encompassed, there was holes in the middle. But what do you do when there's um, islands actually in your in your hyperspace? How does that work? Yes, so there are oh, three, we are in three competing hypotheses in a sense, right? The first one is that it might be a, 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 because we couldn't sample, right? So it might be connected, but we didn't have a point there. In that case, it's just sampling problem. But mm -hmm. in terms of persistent homology, you might be able to see depending on the radius and where this island is, it might form a hole in between the island and the mainland, let's put it this way, right? Yeah. And that will show up in your persistence diagram as well. And the other approach is what we're trying to do is to actually design a method to actually create those hyperspace in a way that we are more confident that those islands, if they are there, they exist, in which case then if you have a hole in persistence homology, you're kind of more confident that they are true. Right. Yeah, you can find it. Yeah, I wish I could show you some plots. Um, yeah. but, you know, oh, we can talk about it later. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Because maybe you could create like a convex hull around the entire space and then just look at yes, yeah, something like that. Yeah, there's actually a question from the audience. I, I should oh. I should not dominate with all of my questions. Yeah. Um, uh, from this is from Ray Heaton. Um, mm -hmm. regarding the math uh, stats dichotomy. Sorry, maths. It's hard yeah. for me to do this in American yeah. uh, stats uh, dichotomy. How do these relate to data? And do you have any advice on collecting data, how to analyze or store data? And how can ecologists do this to be useful when testing or analyzing their data and doing comparisons? Yeah, so the, the dichotomy, and this is, I mean, bear in mind that this is a biologist talking about, <laughs> they're probably going to kill me. Um, the dichotomy is that if you're talking about maths, you're talking about a, a very exact science, right? It, they have a formula, they have an equation, and the equation describes, and they have proofs. They work by proving. Statistics is a field of probability, in a sense. So you're talking about distribution of variables, right? So the way of thinking, it's, it's, it's different. And if you approach a problem, you can approach a problem in different ways. So you, talk, you can approach a problem, let's say, looking at hyperspaces in ecology, for instance, thinking about probabilistic, okay, what is, you know, what is the distribution of this, what is the population that I'm sampling from, all this, all these aspects. But when you look at the shape itself of those hypervolumes, let's say you can ask questions about the geometry, about the curvature, and these are aspects that are mathematical, they are precise, you have one value for the curvature at every single point, there is no error associated with it, in a sense, right, you can input an error, you can make a created distribution, but the concept itself is exact. Does that answer the question, you think? I think so. I will let Ray maybe uh, mention if I think so. But yeah. I think that, that sounds like a really great answer. Um, we're actually pretty much out of time here. Oh, oh really? okay. So Ray followed up. How can one decide to support one's paper by maths versus stats? To support? Um... I think it's a fluid. So the dichotomy is actually blended in a sense, right? So you use, you support what you're trying to achieve, right? You have a, a goal with your paper uh, and you just find the, the ways to actually measure whatever you're trying to measure. And if that comes from stats, that's great. If you can resolve using only stats, that's great. If you can, if you blend the two of them, that's great too. It's just a matter of finding what best solves and addresses the problem that you're looking at, I suppose. Um, I also saw, we had, I think, a hand raised, um, but it looks like it went down. Uh, okay. 
if anybody else has uh, a question, do you? Oh uh, yeah, there's a I hand raised. I can. There see is. Your okay. Hand. Was yeah. it was it Kamal? Um, oh, okay. There's two hands raised. Um, okay, I will allow uh, Kamal uh, to go ahead and talk. Oh, I think. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Actually, you just answered my question. The question, the prior question. It was about how to decide what statistical methods to use for. Uh, well, for me, it would be conservation, monitoring conservation, either acoustic indices or or um, uh, presence absence surveys. Actually, it's just a, 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 a just a note on acoustic signals. You might use, for instance, uh, you have statistical models to measure acoustic signals and patterns, but you also have, for instance, Fourier transformations. There are mathematical concepts in a sense, right? Um, so you can, for instance, apply those two in combination to to resolve and gain further insights in, in, in your particular problem. Do, do you have any references or, or background reading? Um, uh, I can, yeah, if you send me an email, I can send those to you, yeah, on my Aberdeen email account. Uh, is that okay? Would that be okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's brilliant. Thank you very much. And thanks for your talk. Thanks. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> I was absolutely baffled. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I hope There's... in a good way, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there was one other question that had um, hand that had come up. If that person wants to put their hand back up, um, by all means. Um, was Actually, saying, uh, there's a question in chat um, about okay. data sets. Right. Okay. It says, um, are there data sets for foreign invasive species in this country that you can apply your methods to? Oh, interesting. Can you repeat that? Sorry, there, there was a... Are, are there data sets for invasive species in this country that you can apply your methods to? Yeah. You see where they fit in that hypervolume, right? Yeah, yeah. There are invasive uh, data for invasive species. There actually, there is a collection of invasive species worldwide uh, that, that a database for, for that, and that we are we're going to try to to implement that for sure. Uh, um, for now, what we're trying to do is just to make it solid in the sense of... Uh, trying to understand the ecological significance of these holes first. And then if it is indeed a, a, you know, a, a, a way in which invasive species could invade, then we can say, okay, let's look at if they are actually invading through those holes that we see in the hypervolume. But that's a good question, yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, um, if there aren't any more questions, um, we are slightly over time now, um, but there's a lot, a lot of interesting things to talk about. You covered a huge range of exciting topics and I certainly uh, will be following up with many, many um, questions because I think this is really great uh, methods to apply. And um, it's nice to talk to somebody who also has had to learn them uh, from a very different position. Yeah. So um, just to close um, for our, all of our participants, everybody, um, it would be, uh, a First of all, thanks to all of you for attending. Um, I know many more people also watch these later on, on YouTube. So um, thank you for all of them. And thank you for the amazing lecture. Um, for those of you who don't know that much about the Linnaean Society, um, I just want to uh, direct you to our website where you can find more about what our society does. Um, if you're interested in becoming a, a fellow of the society or a member, please do uh, get in touch. Um, we're very happy to really have anybody who has a passion for nature join our society and, and help us fulfill our, our mission um, and our vision of a world where, where nature is valued, um, understood and, and protected. We have um, a lot of awards and medals for those of you who, some of you may have attended last night's anniversary meeting where we um, presented awards and prizes to the many people that are doing fantastic work, both from an amateur and professional um, background uh, in the field of natural history. So if you think of some great people that you think deserve to be recognized, do you consider um, nominating them for these awards? The awards are now open for next year's slate. So please do get in touch. And also um, just to remind you all that uh, to check out our events, we have an incredible slate of events coming up. The next one uh, next week is on saving corals from the lab to the field. And then we have, that's followed by the week later, in the Indispensable Sanctuaries, um, Linnaeus's Lens of Charles Darwin's Basculum, and many more really exciting talks throughout this month and of course in the following months. So please do tune in. I um, hope to see many more of you um, at all of those and hopefully um, in person at some of our events when we get back into Burlington House, um, now that we're starting to come back into 
um, yeah, physical meetings. So thank you all again. And thank you, Giuliano. Um, and uh, have you. a great rest of your day. Thank you.